perfect. Wait, notification. And thank you again, Sarah. Here we go. And okay, boom. And we are live. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to a very special edition of Off the Record on the People's Podcast this evening. We have a magnificent guest, one who's going to give us some amazing information as well as inspiration, and that is no, none other than the world-renowned Dr. Umar Johnson himself. Peace, my brother. How are you doing, sir? Peace and Pan-Africanism, my brother. Glad to be with you. Yes, sir. The honor is mine. And on behalf of myself, my family, and the viewing audience, we want to once again say peace to you as well, sir. Well, uh, Dr. Umar, you've been trending. I don't know if you noticed that, know that or not, uh, over the past two days, dealing with the Kyrie Irving situation, the uh, Kanye West situation, just so much with your views on it. Uh, what would you suggest to the people who, uh, about, what are your thoughts on the Kyrie Irving situation? That's what it's like. I think that as I hear and listen to people in our community respond and chime in on the situation, I think it's important that we take both a microscopic view of what's going on as well as a macroscopic view of what is going on. And what I mean by that, on the microscopic level, this appears to be an issue involving two celebrities and the European Jewish community on the microscopic level. But we have to zoom out and look at this situation from a much wider view. Mm -hmm. And that is to say that the greater issue at stake here for all of us is the freedom of speech as it relates to black people in general. I'm looking not only at Kanye West being silenced for saying things that go against the dominant European narrative, Kyrie Irving being silenced for saying things that go against the dominant European narrative. We just saw a sister get fired from MSNBC for a comment she made on someone's podcast while she wasn't even at work. Um, we saw Jalen Rose uh, forced to apologize yes, for sir. giving an honest opinion and one that I agreed with as related to the Ime Udoka scandal. So what I think is going on right now is I think the power structure is trying to create an atmosphere where black people in general and celebrities in particular are no longer able to give their God-given opinions mm -hmm. on any issue relevant to us as a people. And now, seeing what's happening now, I would dare argue that the cancel culture, the cancel culture may have very well been invented by the white power structure and has come 360 and may have originally always been aimed at canceling the free black voice. Because one thing we know, when they target African people, they never focus directly on us when the initiative is first brought forth and let out of the bag. So for example, if we look at AIDS, we were originally told that the AIDS virus was for gay white men. Hmm. So most black people said, well, wait a minute, I'm not gay and I'm not a white male. So AIDS couldn't possibly have anything to do with us. And now AIDS is the number one killer of heterosexual or one of the top killers of heterosexual black women. It was always designed to eliminate black life. But when they released the AIDS virus, they propagandized it from the perspective that this is about gay white men, so black people would not even think twice about AIDS. Mm, mm. And then it now, and now look at the way it's ravaging the lives of black women. And we've seen other things go on this way, you know, where it looks like it has nothing to do with us at all. But in the final analysis at 11.59, 24 hours later, we recognize, wow, 
this whole thing may have been about us. Me too. When yeah. Me Too movement first started, it looked like it was just about going after white men who were sexually harassing and victimizing black women. And then they ended up lynching Bill Cosby with it, right? And then it came to other black men with it. And we like, wait a minute, we thought Me Too was white women getting back at black men. Now we see Me Too all along was about destroying black males, but they had to get the momentum up and they had to get us to co-sign it to give it the momentum. And then by the time it gets around to us, it has gained so much steam that we can't turn it off. You look at Barack Obama's presidency. Many black people saw Obama as a weapon against racism. But in the final analysis, and now we look at Obama in hindsight, which is always 2020, Yes, sir. We see Barack Obama wasn't a weapon against racism. Barack Obama was a weapon for racism. Mm, mm, Barack mm. Obama is the president who stripped Black people of all their rights and all their stature in this country as a so-called minority group and gave it to every other people except us. Here's the one thing that we need to be clear about. When Barack Obama became president, we were already doing bad. That's not his fault. But what is his fault? Even though we were already doing bad, we were the priority minority. Mm. We were the priority minority in America mm. from the beginning of British North American slavery in 1619 until Barack Obama became president in 2009. Mm. We were the priority minority, every president, every governor, every mayor, every congressperson, every state legislature had to have a position on black people as it related to every issue. They may not have done nothing for you, but they had to give a position statement on where do you stand with blacks? Mm, mm. Now here we are in the post Obama era. Tomorrow, my brother, as you know, is election day, midterm yes, federal elections. Yes, sir. You got over 30 governorships up. You got over 400 Congress seats that will be decided tomorrow. And guess what? Not a single campaign. 435 congressional seats, not a single campaign. Over 30 governor seats, mm. not a single candidate or campaign is dealing with any issues that are critical for black people. Mm. Why? Because Barack Obama made it so that you don't even have to talk about black people no more. You don't even have to give an opinion on black people no more. Police are killing blacks like it's going out of style. So what? The black unemployment rate is at its highest mark since the 60s. So what? Mass incarceration, the black population inside prison is twice the percentage of the black population outside of prison in every single state in America. Let me say that one more time, my brother. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Your percentage of the prison population in the state you live in, I don't care if you in California, I don't care if you in Pennsylvania, I don't care if you in Texas, Illinois, I don't care if you in Michigan, Georgia, Carolinas, every single state in this country, the black percentage of the incarcerated population in that state is at least twice the black percentage of the population inside the state. So let's take Pennsylvania. Black people are 10% of the population of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We are 50% of the prisons. Mm. We are five times our rate in jail that we are in the society. Not a single candidate dealing with it. Police genocide, not a single candidate is dealing with it. Mass incarceration, I just spoke of that. Miseducation, not a single candidate. Economic justice, economic apartheid, which includes reparations, but is no means limited to that. Nobody's dealing with that. And so this election tomorrow that has black people ignored and marginalized who created that? Joe mm. Biden didn't create that. 
He mm. benefited from it, but he didn't create it. He continued the ignoring of the black agenda when he took office. He didn't create it. Donald Trump continued the ignoring of the black agenda, but he didn't create it. Who made black people an irrelevant topic mm. on the political scan landscape? Barack Obama. So getting back to your question, good brother, this cancellation of Kyrie, this cancellation of Kanye West has me really deliberating on whether or not cancel culture from its inception was aimed at canceling Black people who dare to publicly challenge the white power structure's narrative. Hmm. Yes, sir. Excellent. And Dr. Umar, you have so many people showing you love all across the country. Both of my sisters saying peace. Uh, people saying I saw Lincoln, I said the Pamela, I said the brother Robert, everybody, brother James, people from all across the country, brother James, brother Marcel. Thank you for everybody who's showing you love. Can't wait to put this on YouTube. Now, Dr. Umar, uh, what is a solution? How do we combat cancel culture? Here's the issue. And the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey spoke about this over a century ago mm. when he said, it's going to be hard. And I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, it's going to be hard to stand up and fight for what's right as African people if we're not economically independent. If the white man has to provide your livelihood, how can you challenge him? How can you bite the hand that feeds you? See, the issue with Kyrie, the issue with Kanye, although they were man enough to stand their ground, what made it difficult is their livelihood was tied up in the white power structure. When we look at all these buffoons and coons in the black plantation media, the Jalen Roses and the Charles Barkleys and the Shannon Sharps, the Shaquille O'Neal's and the Michael Wilbons and the Jason Williams and the Richard Jeffersons, these Negroes, their livelihood is tied up in white sports media. And so we often see black people put in very uncomfortable situations when it's time to speak truth to power, when you're being paid by the power, you have to speak truth to. Mm -hmm. So if it's one thing we're learning right now, a lesson we should have already learned. Yes, sir. Yes, and sir. that is without economic independence, it's going to be almost impossible for you to fight for your people. One of the things that allows me, and I think the most high God for putting me in that position, even though the work is still tough. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, the work is still tough. As you know, being a member of the Nation of Islam, the work is still tough that he, for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, even when you're independent. It's tough even when you're independent. There's no way I could do what I do if I had to go and push a clock for the white power structure every day. Mm. Because the greatest of all slaveries is economic slavery. Mm. Until you free yourself from dependency on the white power structure for employment, you can't really call yourself free. And mm. that's why one of my prerequisites to be a black leader male or female, because I don't think leadership should be limited to brothers. I think sisters have a lot to say and play in it as well. Yes, sir. But one of my prerequisites to being a black leader is you have to be economically independent. Mm. When I see people stand up and say, I want to be a leader, but you work for the white power structure, I automatically know that there's a timetable. There's either going to be a timetable on your loyalty to us, or there's going to be a timetable for your employment under them. It can't be both ways. Mm, because mm. you can't serve two masters. Yes, when sir. you work for the plantation and you're leading Blacks, there's a timetable, there's a deadline. Either you're getting fired or you're selling out. There's no middle of the room. Mm. There's a certain civil rights leader whose name I will not call, who's done some good things for Black people. Most people would consider him the most preeminent Black civil rights leader in the country right now. He has been totally invisible. Mm. Totally absent since the Kanye West situation started and it's now spread over to Kyrie Irving. You don't see him nowhere. Black celebrity voices and black media voices are being silenced every day for speaking the God's honest truth. 
They didn't call for nobody's death. They didn't call for nobody's torture. They didn't call for nobody's punishment. They're simply giving an opinion and are having their lives destroyed for giving an opinion. Kanye West didn't say somebody needs to be hurt, murdered, lame. Kyrie didn't say that. All these other black folks being canceled by their networks, they didn't offer no violence to nobody. But look at the double standard. Look at the double standard between the way America reacts to Kyrie Irving tweeting a DVD available for sale on Amazon. He tweeted a DVD, didn't say a word. Yes, sir. No hate speech because he didn't speak. He tweeted a DVD. And look at all the attention and all the people rushing to the defense of the untouchables because of a tweeted DVD. But when black people were being murdered in the streets by police, and we still are, we didn't get half the press. We didn't get half the attention. We didn't get half the compassion. We didn't get half the empathy that the untouchables are getting. Look at what they're getting over a tweeted DVD. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Compared to the response Black people got for actual loss of life. It is a double standard. It is hypocritical. And it is unacceptable. Unacceptable. Yes, sir. Thank you for you teaching. And people showing you love all across the country. Thank you all for continuing to like, share, subscribe to the People's Podcast. Okay, Dr. Umar, my next question is you spoke of the Honorable... Uh, Marcus Garvey. And I always had a question because my mother, she was very um, strong on teaching my, me and my siblings about Marcus Garvey, many of the Black history legends. Um, but he, towards the end of his life through my study, you know, even he, the it's almost like Black people, we turned on him. We let him down. What keeps you going when you know that so many of our greats, at some point, the people, it seemed like they do all this work. I'm not saying it's in vain, but it's like the masses of our people, we still fight in this fight so many years later after the great Honorable Marcus Garvey. What keeps you in the fight to not quit? Yes, indeed. And of course, we know one of the tragic themes of the Honorable Marcus Garvey's life here in America was that the preeminent Black leadership of that day, A. Philip Randolph, W.E.B. Du Bois, Cyril Owens, Chandler Briggs, the integrationists, the nationalists, the Marxists, they all came together and went to the United States government and begged them to get rid of Garvey, to deport Marcus Garvey. The leaders, I want to I make sure people understand this now. Yes, sir, yes, sir. The primary leaders of the Black community came together, went to the white power structure and said, please send this man back to Jamaica. They were so jealous because Garvey could do what no one had done then and we hadn't seen done since. And that is organize multiple millions of African people all across the world under a single flag in a single mission of the red, black and green. And yeah. because Garvey had the charisma, none of them had. Garvey had the organizing power, none of them had. Garvey had the vision that none of them had. Rather than work with the man, they wanted to destroy him mm. because that ego of the negro which is the greatest threat to the progress of our people has been a consistent theme throughout black history we've seen where black leaders have silenced or attempted to silence other leaders who were better at doing what they were doing and so unfortunately the government concurred and j edgar hoover who was hired his first job in the fbi mm -hmm. was to bring down garvey and, you know, if I could ask the ancestors one question, I would ask them this. Why was J. Edgar Hoover allowed to live so long mm. that he took down every major Black movement from Garvey to the Panthers? 50 years of destroying Black leaders and Black organizations. As a young man in his 20s with Garvey, all the way up to be an old man in the 70s with the Panthers. J. Edgar Hoover was allowed to live that long. And white folks were not shameful of the illegal and deceitful and inhumane tactics of J. Edgar Hoover because they named the FBI building in his honor after he died. Now look at this now. It's been proven that he broke the law. It's been proven that he violated people's rights. It's been proven that he abandoned human rights. The government admits this. The church committee investigations admits that J. Edgar Hoover operated outside the law and without official sanction.
from U.S. Congress. But did they give a damn? They still named the FBI building after J. Edgar Hoover. But to answer your question, good brother, what keeps Dr. Umar in this fight? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is, and of course, both myself and the most honorable Marcus Garvey were both Leos. He's August 17th. I'm August the 21st. Okay, okay, yes, sir. Uh, what keeps me in this fight, and of course, we have other Pan Africanist Leos, His Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie the first. We have Anna Julia Cooper, who is the first Black woman in Washington, D.C. to earn a PhD. She's one of the mothers of Pan Africanism. She's a Leo. We have Dr. Edward Wilmont Blyden who came from America, from St. Thomas in the Caribbean to go to seminary school and they denied him. So he ends up in Liberia and becomes secretary of state. And of course we have the great one, the great emperor Menelik II, born on the same day as Garvey, August 17th, who defeated the Italians in the battle of Ottawa in Ethiopia in 1896, I wanna say 1897, when the whole world told him to stand down that there's no way your African army will be able to challenge the might of the Italian militia. And he destroyed the, the, the Italians in that war. Mm -hmm. But to get to the point, I've been into black consciousness, good brother, since I was a nine year old student in, in fourth grade at the Mead Elementary School in North Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I was introduced to black consciousness there in the black history class that we had, which was not mandatory for the district, but mandatory for us. It was also my introduction into black, uh, into public speaking and oratory because there was a black history contest. So I entered the black history contest both years, fourth and fifth grade. For whatever reason, they discontinued the black history class in sixth grade. I still remember coming back for my sixth grade year only to find out that they had canceled the black history class. It, it, it messed me up mentally mm -hmm. because I was so into it. I was so into the public speaking. And so for me, and as you know, many people come to Black consciousness for different reasons. Yes, sir. Some people were part of the Black bourgeoisie, became disenchanted with it. Some people were gatekeepers for the white power structure and were disinvited. Some people spent some time in incarceration and got woke and came to it. Some people <laughs> yes, got sir. tired of the church or the, or the uh, uh, colorblind Orthodox Islamic movement and gave that up and came into consciousness. And all those roads are great roads. Mm -hmm. But my road was organic. I didn't come to this as a reaction against mm -hmm. anything else. I, it's all I've known since nine years old. And so even with my degrees, I have six of them, uh, three white universities, my PhD, my three master's degree, my two bachelor's degree, my certifications. I have never abandoned my mission because to answer your question in simple terms, good brother, I believe I was born to do the work that I'm doing. Yes, and sir. when you're certain, when you are certain about the work you're doing, no matter how tough it gets, your reassurance comes from the fact that you are cemented mm. in your belief that this is where you're supposed to be. Yes, sir. And you may call it imagination. Uh, you may call it nostalgia. But being related to arguably the greatest Black leader of the 19th century and the Honorable Frederick Douglass, who I'm related to by blood. Yes, sir. Yes, and sir. also being related to the seventh bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Bishop Alexander Wayman, by way of my four times great grandmother, who was his niece. Mm. This is the black man who wrote the first history, comprehensive history of Richard Island's AME. He's also one of the founders of the Underground Railroad Station in Philadelphia that William still inherited. So to, have, to be related to those two giants by blood, to be born the same week as Marcus Garvey, although separated by many years, you know, to be born on the day of the Nat Turner War, August the 21st, all of that only helps to reaffirm me and my belief that I'm born to do what I do. And it is that belief that sustains me through the trials and tribulations of working for our people. Excellent, excellent. all praises due. And people are showing you love all across the country. I see all of your comments. Uh, Dr. Umar, we have a few more questions for you, but at first we have a quick 60 second commercial break. No problem. For all of the sponsors of the People's Podcast, I want to thank everybody who's showing love all across the country. Can't wait to put this on YouTube. And we come right back to Dr. Umar. Please, please continue to put your questions in the comments. Thank you all very much. Brother Rashad Street Premier. He has a 4K camera and a drone. He does television and film editing. Please reach out to him if you need any of those services. 
Sister Miriam's, ABC I Love Me, children's book and coloring book, and now Spanish book. All three available on Amazon.com. Sister Naima's Stay On Point Dance Academy, LLC. She teaches ballet virtually to young girls all across the country, right here in the studios of Atlanta, Georgia. Rock Communications, if you're working on a book and you need copy, editing, project management, content development, or media relations, please reach out to Rock Communications. Student Minister Robert L. Muhammad's Conflict Mediation, squashing the beast throughout the Southwest region, he does a phenomenal job. His wife, Sister Fudia Muhammad's Giving Birth to a God and the Science of Child Wearing. Please make sure you go out and get a copy of her book as well. Fashion Gods, Urban Streetwear Clothing for Men and Boys, 314-329-6009. He'll keep you dressed in the best of fashion. Brother Kenneth's Bow Tie Maker Extraordinaire. He'll ship you bow ties anywhere across the nation. Tosh Hollywood's Chemistry 6 episode, a new television series out on YouTube. He's looking for actors and writers. Make sure you support him. Keep It Hood, helping others overcome depression. Also by Taj Hollywood. Brother Aaron's Elevated Places, stress management, real estate, credit, repair, and restoration. His Respect for Life Center, they do personal wellness, philosophy, emotional, and mental spiritual wellness. 229-344-1474. Dr. Henry Carter's King Henry Turkey Legs, right here in Atlanta, Georgia. Brother Rashad Muhammad's COVID-19 Disinfected Cleaning Services out of Chicago. Student Minister Sharif Muhammad's book, A Soldier in a Movement of Christ, available on adulsharif.com. And lastly, Brother Joshua Muhammad's book, Cleopatra, as well as No Father, No Excuse, both available on Amazon. Thank you all very much. Right back to Dr. Umar. People are showing you love, all kind of questions. And thank you, Dr. Umar. Okay, my next question for you, sir, is uh, being on the front line, uh, traveling and speaking and being a public figure as you are, have you ever been faced with fear? And if so, how do you overcome fear? That's a great question. And before I answer that, for the benefit of your listening audience, I want to let them know that number one, and I'm sure you'll probably ask a question on this whole education thing with our children anyway. Yes, sir. But I want them to know that if they ever are in need of any consultation, Mm. Uh, for their children. If your child is in public school and they're picking on them or you see racism showing up or the teacher isn't giving him the right grade or they want him evaluated for autism or a learning disability or a speech problem or an emotional disturbance or ADHD or conduct disorder where they want to put your baby on some Ritalin or some Adderall or some Concerto or some Cyclert or some metadata you don't know who to turn to to find out whether you need to be making this decision or not, feel free to reach out to me, Dr. Umar Johnson, Saving Our Children is what I'm about. Education and mental health is my expertise and my cell number for those who ever need to reach me for that purpose, 215-989-9858. Again, that's 215-989-9858. I also want your audience to know that Saturday after next, November the 19th here in Philadelphia, I will be hosting another of my Black Parent Know Your School Right boot camps. Mm, mm, and mm, this is mm. a 12 hour Know Your School Rights training that goes from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We do take breaks, we do cater lunch, we do provide refreshments, and it's a lot of fun. But I teach parents everything they need to know to be effective as an advocate in the mental health institutions and the educational institutions. So we go through the disabilities, we go through the 504, we go through the IEP, we go through the behavior plans, we go through the intervention plans, we go through the psychological evaluations, the federal education laws, the state policies, discipline law and rights. So if there's any parents who wanna know how to be in a position to better advocate for their children, join us in Philadelphia. It's open to any African parent in the world who feels the need to come and get the education. It'll be taking place in Philadelphia November the 19th, and they can register for that on my website, drumarjohnson.com, or they could text message me for the link 
uh, 215-989-9858. To answer your question, when I study many of my heroes, when I look at Malcolm, I look at Martin, I look at Medgar, I look at Fred Hampton, I look at George and Jonathan Jackson, I go back to the antebellum years and I look at Martin Delaney and Frederick Douglass and yes, Henry Highland Garnett. I look at Bishop Turner during Reconstruction and Booker T during Reconstruction. And what I found was being in this work, you're always faced with the possibility of an early death. Mm -hmm. It comes with the territory. And you're not only faced with that possibility of an early death from whites, but you're faced with that possibility of early death from blacks who may envy you for your position. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I think that you have to keep your heart pure and you have to keep your spirituality alive and you have to keep your relationship with the most high strong and intact. And so part of what I do to remain as fearless as possible. Yes, sir. Is, you know, I practice traditional African spirituality. Uh, specifically speaking, I follow the Ifa tradition of the Yoruba peoples of Southwest Nigeria. Mm. With that being said, I was raised Muslim. So I'll go into a masjid and pray. I have no issue with it. Mm. I, my mother is Christian. My father was Muslim. I go into a church and pray. I go into a Hebrew temple and pray. To me, God is one. Mm. There's many paths and roads, but God is one. So I'm just as comfortable in any Black religious institution as I am in a traditional African spiritual house honoring and worshiping the most high. But with that being said, I stay close to my ancestors as much as I can. I try to pray, um, I try to pray every day. Yes, with travels, it can make it sometimes difficult, but I like to bend down and put my head on the ground, you know, and prostrate before the most high because I recognize that we are all here to achieve a destiny and we're only gonna achieve that destiny if we align our will with divine will. So I'm always trying to make sure my work is in alignment with divine will, you know, but I saw how fear sometimes paralyzed the peace of mind of many of our leaders. Mm, mm. And I don't ever want to, I don't ever want to get to the point where I'm wishing for death because I have no peace in life. Mm, and I think you. for some of our leaders, they got to the point, they were so overcome with the dread of when they were going to die that I think they secretly wished for the death. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. I want to go down fighting like Nat Turner. I want to go down fighting like Cassant La Overture and John Jacques Dessalines and yes, sir. Yes, sir. Gabriel yes, sir. Prosser yes, sir. and Denmark Vesey. Uh -huh. you, know, you know, two of the quotes, and I'm big on Nat Turner, obviously being born on August the 21st, and we will be in Nat Turner land uh, this Friday. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if you've ever met Baba Khalifa or his son, Khalifa Jr., who are both yes, proud I members did. of the Nation of Islam. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, they have the Nat Turner uh, celebration on August the 21st, which is the commencement of the war. And then we also celebrate on uh, November the 11th, which is the day Nat Turner was hanged. Mm -hmm. So that will be this Friday. So anybody who wants to come and partake in that to learn the life and legacy of Nat Turner, the things that you may have never heard and can only get from a teacher or a master teacher, like Baba Khalifa, you can go to natturnerlibrary.com. Uh, that's natturnerlibrary.com. I've been going down there consistently for 11 years. Mm. I have had to miss maybe three. I think I've missed three, but this is my 11th year anniversary of going to the Nat Turner Trail. So I'm always there on my birthday, August 21st, and I'm always there on November the, on November the 11th. But two quotes from Nat Turner's Confessions. And one is Nat Turner says the spirit spoke to him and said, such, quote, such is your luck, such you are called to do. Mm, mm. And whether it comes rough or smooth, you shall surely bear it. Mm, mm. I repeat that. Mm. That is one of my mantras. Because what that says is Nat Turner was told by the spirit whether you die or don't die, whether you lose or win, whether your comrades are murdered, no matter what you got to go through, this is your work to do and you cannot equivocate your mission. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and the other quote from that term, 
is when Thomas Gray, who interviewed Nat Turner on November the 1st, his trial was the 5th. And of course he was executed on the 11th. So this is Nat Turner week. Uh, Thomas Gray asked him during the interview. He said, because Nat Turner, as you know, was inspired by God, according yes, to his words. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And because from the European perspective, he was unsuccessful from the European perspective. They didn't understand that 191 years later, Nat Turner would be inspiring us right now. You know, Nat Turner, when he was asked, the white man said, do you not find yourself mistaken now? Mm -hmm. You claim God told you to do this. Most of your soldiers have been assassinated. You will be hanged in a few days. Do you not find yourself mistaken? And Nat Turner replied with four words. And I believe these four words, his answer to that question was the most unapologetically African response I've ever heard from a black leader. Mm. I've ever heard from any general in any war, mm. especially on the eve of their hanging. Mm. And that Turner said, was not Christ crucified. Mm. Was not Christ. In other words, you think I've lost because I'm in this cell with these chains and I'm about to be hanged by my neck in a few days. But did they not do the same thing to Christ? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And did he not in the end, although he lost his physical life, do not people honor his spiritual life every single day across this world? Do not people honor Nat Turner every single day across this world? And when Nat Turner said, was not Christ crucified, I said, my God, this man is about to die. Mm. And he's still looking white people boldly and proudly in the eyes to say, you think this is a victory for you, mm. but mm. it's really a victory for me. In my hanging, I will live forever. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Powerful black dude, white people are showing you love all across the country. Dr. Henry M. Carter says we are uh, spiritual, universal. I mean, universally, yes, sir, you're teaching. We appreciate your work, Dr. Umar. People are showing you love. Thank you and saluting you and showing you love. Thank you, everybody who's watching. My sister Naima just asked me, uh, Dr. Umar, she said, uh, what do you think about the double standard in interracial dating versus when a black man gets a white woman, it seems like he's more tech versus when a black woman gets a, a white man? For me, I think brothers and sisters should equally be held accountable. Mm -hmm. I absolutely do. With that being said, I do believe the black man's lack of commitment to the black woman does influence her choice mm. to go outside of the community. Mm. When you look at the fact that only 25% of able-bodied black women will be married in this country, that's one in four. If you have four daughters, only one statistically is likely to get married. Mm. If we're trying to save the black family, that statistic has to be changed. And I think that we have to be unapologetic in our commitment to the black family to the point where we are respectful, but yet critical mm. of black people who choose to create families with non-African people because there's no greater commitment you can make short of giving your life than pledging your life to somebody who looks like you in this cause of African redemption. You know, I often say that the white woman on the black man's arm is a surrender flag. Mm. That he waves to the white power structure, letting his enemy know that I am safe, I am comfortable, I am committed to your agenda, and I will turn my back on my people in mm. order to be patted on the head by you. And so when the white man sees the black man with the white woman, he knows this is a Negro that we can trust. Because he <laughs> turned his entire back, he turned his entire back on his community to marry a white woman who he knows cares nothing about the freedom, liberation, or emancipation of his people. Mm. Marriage is a political decision. And when I talk to brothers who suffer from the snow bunny crisis and they inbox me, they email me, when I speak to these snow bunnies, they always try to explain away their choice to be with a white woman. But at the end of the day, you cannot explain it away because there's no way you're gonna claim to be committed to your community. Mm when you decided to start a family with a woman of another community. Right. And when you understand that all white people are racist, not all white people are bigots, but all white people are racist, mm. which means all white people are totally, totally committed to the unfair advantage they get 
and to the unfair distribution of resources, opportunities, and privileges. There's not a white person on planet Earth who wants to redistribute privileges, opportunities, and fairly with everybody else on this planet. Mm. They love the biased advantage they have. They love the disproportionality that benefits them. There would be no white privilege if there was not for in unequal opportunities. Mm. So we have to understand that white woman that sleeps with the black man is just as opposed to black freedom as any other white person is. And she knows her black husband is okay with that. He's okay mm. sleeping with the enemy. And that's why I cannot trust, although I love all black people, including those who suffer from snow bunny virus, I cannot trust the black man. I will not trust the black man or black woman mm. who marries outside of their community, because as far as I'm concerned, you already got one foot into betrayal. And the other foot will soon be there, too. Mm, excellent response, sir. Thank you for your transparency and honesty. Thank you, Naima, for your question. Um, my, my next question for you, sir, is what about it with the opposite of conscious, somebody who's enlightened, knowledge itself, they are conscious, but they attract to some, a black person or African, um, but the sister may not be as conscious, she may be more wild or vice versa, the brother may be um, more worldly or street, but the sister's very conscious. What about that dynamic? She needs to be careful. Because I hear from plenty of queens in the conscious movement who are struggling with the fact that she is awake and her king is asleep. Mm, mm. And she has babies that she has made with this coon. Mm. And I do a lot of life coaching with sisters in this predicament. And they're like, Dr. Uma, what do I do? Because I don't want to break my family up. My children need their father, but at the same time, my spirit, my spirit mm. can no longer tolerate the low political and spiritual vibration that this man is operating on. And see what happens is a lot of times they meet each other at the same vibration, at the same level of political intelligence, but she studied harder. Mm. So she yeah. began to grow. And in her growth, she can no longer tolerate where she once operated. Mm. And because he's comfortable just sitting around watching ball games, he's comfortable just hanging out smoking marijuana, he's comfortable just copying the social life of white folks, she no longer is. And of course, one of the first things they teach us when you're training to be a psychologist is you never give answers to your clients you, you inspire them to come up with their own answers. So I never tell women, you got to leave a stay. I simply say, you do have to think in the long term. And if this man is not going to change who he is, how long will you put your own happiness off mm. to be with a Negro? We have to make sure we are not committing and reproducing with coons. Mm. Mm. It's one of the greatest destabilizers of peace of mind and it's not good for the struggle either because if you got to fight at home with yes, your sir. mate yes sir if you got to fight your mate in order to fight with the people if they're stopping you from participating in the freedom struggle if they're constantly questioning what you've decided to give your life to you can't be with that person mm, mm. you know speaking from experience you know i've been through this myself where you meet women Occasionally, I've dated queens in my past where they like me, but they don't like what I'm living for. Mm. That's a contradiction. Yes, sir. So yes, basically sir. what you are attracted to is the superficialities. You like the doctorate degree. You like the social stature. Mm. You like the global presence. You like the six foot three with the beard. You want me for the superficial. Yes, sir. Characteristic. But you're telling me that my life is dedicated to Black people, even until death. And you want nothing to do with my political struggle, mm. but you want to be my queen? Mm. You want to raise my children, but you want nothing to do with my political struggle. Then you want nothing to do with me. Let me make this decision for you. Mm. Because if you think I'm just looking for a pretty face, you come to the wrong place. If you think I'm just looking for a dashiki and a head wrap, you've come to the wrong place. 
okay? Don't get me wrong. Your mate doesn't have to be as diehard as you, but she has to have conscious leaning. When people see her, they got to see a reflection of you. Yes, sir. And I yes, think sir. too often in the conscious community, not to judge nobody because none of us are great enough to judge others, but you see where there's people who date women who have nothing to do with the political struggle. Mm -hmm. A lot of brothers in the conscious community are dating women who have nothing at all to do with the struggle. I mean, weave wearing, uh, white Louis bag, <laughs> white friends, white I mean, their life is a total contradiction of what he claims to be about, and this is his wife. And I would never say nothing to a brother about his wife. That's your wife, but I will say something about you if you ask me. And I would have to tell him, black man, you live in a lie. Mm. There's no way you're going to tell me that you are about the freedom of African people and your wife is about the total support of white capitalism and white society and white culture. You can't serve two masters, my brother. Mm. There's mm. no way in hell you believe in this and she don't. You're sleeping with a woman who could care less about what happens to black people, but yet you claim to be totally committed to what happens to black people. You're living a lie, my brother. You're mm. living a lie. She don't have to be as dedicated to the struggle as you, but when I see her, I should see some reflection of you. And mm. if I don't, you're a hypocrite. Damn. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. So, Dr. Umar, first of all, thank you, Sister Selena says, 100 a lot of people says, damn, that's deep. People showing love. Sister Jamila Fia, everybody's showing love. Okay, great. Thank you all for all across the country. What advice would you give to someone? right? I'm a single man and I, I feel like I'm enlightened. I got the knowledge of self and I'm looking, right? So what advice would you give to somebody who's single, who's looking, who I don't, I want my other half, you know, to be like, okay, and it, I want you, if you never, when you meet me, because we're going to meet, you know, God willing soon and whether I got to come to Philly or not, because I really want to pick your brain. I'm, I admire you very much, Dr. Umar. And, but if you saw my wife or you saw my queen, my other half, I want you to be like, oh, that makes sense that he's, how, how do you, what advice would you give about picking and choosing someone? I would say if you're in the struggle for our people. Yes, sir. You have to put your wife to work with our people mm, mm. to see if she's what our people needs. Mm. So as I study sisters, I'm looking to see, are you what the people need to see next to me? Mm, mm, so mm. I'm looking for a sister. Five things are mandatory. Okay. They're not okay. the only five, but they're mandatory. Yes, sir. Number one, are you secure enough in yourself to be with a man who gets the type of attention that I'm going to get from sisters? Mm -hmm. that, that's important. Yes, sir. Because if you date a woman who's antisocial or insecure or jealous of other women, it's going to show and it's going to undermine your ability to bring our people together. Mm, mm. So you have to make sure you put her to work to see how she works with other black women. You got to see how she works with other black women. Yes, the sir. worst thing you can do is get a woman that other sisters do not like. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, she cannot be a bourgeoisie. Okay. And a lot of our sisters have been stung with that bourgeoisie bug. Absolutely. You have to make sure she's not a bourgeoisie and elitist carry that air of arrogance. You know, I've met good sisters in the past, but some of them were too elitist in their mindset. They saw themselves as better than other women. And my wife cannot be a sister who looks down upon sisters. Mm. You have to be humble and you have to have a grassroots spirit. I'm not interested in hierarchy. I'm mm. not interested in hierarchy. I'm interested in organization. Mm. Number three, she got to be able to hold you down. Mm. And, which means she cannot be a chatty patty because you have enemies and you're going to make enemies in this work. As brother yeah. Malcolm said, if you ain't got no enemies, you ain't working. That's right. And That's you got to right. make sure that when she has, when you two are at opposition, can she hold her peace long enough for y'all to work it out? Mm. Or can she hurt, hold her peace long enough for y'all to go and sit down with some elders and receive some counsel. You cannot marry a chatty patty. If you want a liberation trial, if you got a woman, who cannot keep a secret. If you got a woman mm. who has to run her mouth to somebody, mm. 
she's putting your life in danger. Yes, sir. She is, but and I'm gonna tell you, there's a lot of women out here. They cannot resist the temptation of telling their relationship business to other people who do not have, who should not know about what's going on in your household. If your woman cannot respect the sanctity and the privacy of your household, she cannot be your woman. So you have to constantly study her for her verbal and emotional discipline. Mm, your yes, wife yes. must have verbal and emotional discipline. And another factor, if you leave this world before she does, can you trust that she will choose another mate who is similar to you as it relates to your commitment to our freedom struggle? Mm -hmm. In other words, if you were to pass on and come back, would she be with a white man? Would mm -hmm. she be with a drug dealer? Would she be with a member of the black bourgeoisie? Would she be dating one of these sexually confused brothers? Like, <laughs> you gotta make sure this, she's not thirsty. She cannot be romantically thirsty. Mm -hmm. She has to have a woman, she has to be a woman that says, even though I want a man, I gotta make sure I choose the right man to be around his children. Mm. I have to choose a man that he would approve of. If she thirsty, she gonna choose any man that's available. Mm. So you gotta make sure you don't have a thirsty woman because a thirsty woman, just like a thirsty man, they can't be alone for long. Yes, sir. And they will settle for anything that shows up. So you got to make sure she's not romantically thirsty. and. The fifth thing, she has to have her own life within the struggle. Mm. She has to have her own life within the struggle because if she is a woman who wants a husband who lives a traditional nine to five life, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you want you a nine to five husband, you know, a regular brother, he works, comes home, and he spends the rest of the day with you. Nothing is wrong with that. But it is unfair for a woman who wants a fairy tale life to be trying to be wed to a revolutionary brother. Mm. Revolutionaries and activists don't live white picket fence lives. Mm, mm. They're not home every day at five o'clock. Mm, mm. And you have, so, you have a lot of sisters, and this is not a weakness. I wanna be clear, it's okay if a sister is so in love with the idea of love that she needs her man to stare in her face all day long. <laughs> Nothing's wrong with that. Yes, but sir. get you a man whose lifestyle is conducive. Mm. Don't get you no activist. Don't get you no community leader. Don't get you no revolutionary because you might go weeks before you see him again. Mm. You might go months before y'all can go out on a date if y'all can go out at all for purposes of safety. Mm. So, you know, when you are a Betty Shabazz, a Coretta Scott, a Amy Garvey, a Anna Douglas, a Miley Evers, you don't expect to live a storybook life. Mm. Okay. You are the wife of a revolutionary. And because of that, romance takes a backseat to revolution. As you always hear me say, revolution over romance. That's right. That's right. Politics over punani consciousness over the cookies organization over intimacy black power business before the bedroom and if your woman can't understand what that is you might not want to make her your woman mm. well, we might drop the gym y'all this free game thank you very much Dr. Umar. thank you very much um people are so, uh people in the comments who never watch are just really just need to they're really trying to slide in your inbox at this point where all of their compliments they just really uh he gave out his number earlier, so you all can uh, text him. Uh, my next question for you, uh, Dr. Umari, is you didn't say nothing about looks. Uh -huh. you, didn't, you didn't say that. So you're saying, honestly, Dr. Umari's a man, you know, man to man. You know, mm -hmm. don't matter. You don't judge a man based if his woman find it out. You ain't, ain't nothing, nothing. Well, nothing. remember now, you have your preferences. Okay, okay. And then you have your non-negotiables, right? <laughs> okay, okay. You may have a preference for an attractive woman. You always hear me say, I love them five, five, thick in the thighs with natural hair. That's my preference. Yes, sir, yes, sir. But if I find a sister who's not curvy, I tend to not be attracted to petite women, right? Mm -hmm. I love curvy sisters. Mm -hmm. But if I come across a petite sister or a full-figured sister, okay, okay, 
who has everything that I need in a wife, but she simply lacks the phenotypical, I'd be a fool to overlook her for mm. looks. You mm. understand? So even though physical attraction is what initially allows us to gravitate to a particular sister, it can't keep you there. Mm. If the non-negotiables are not there. So yes, I have, we have as men, our physical preferences, but that preference should not blind you to what the non-negotiables are. Physicality cannot override the universality of having a queen that can be a rod or die in this movement. Because if you get you a narcissist, mm. you get you one of these histrionic sisters, OCD, where all they do is look in the mirror all day long. There's some mm. sisters on Instagram, no disrespect at all. All they do is take selfies. They can't have a job. Mm, mm. Every time you get on Instagram, it's a new selfie, a mm. new selfie. Beautiful women, but sister, do you have a life? Mm. Like, is mm. your life purely to look pretty? Because that's a very shallow life. Mm. Mm. And I'm telling you now, if you're dating a woman, who's overly preoccupied with her physical beauty, she will not make a, a good wife because that psychologically speaks, speaking hints at a deep-seated insecurity. Anybody who's overly preoccupied with their exterior has psychological vulnerabilities in the interior. You should tread very lightly with them. It's like when I see a woman who has to cake on makeup. Ever see a sister? Every time they come outside, 50 pounds of makeup. Yes, sir, yes, sir. There's insecurities there. There's some serious psychological issues going on. Some women can't even walk out the house if they're not done up. They can never have a normal day. It's mm. all about makeup. That's insecurities. I want a sister who's comfortable with some shea butter and some lip gloss. <laughs> I want a sister who's comfortable pulling her hair back in a ponytail yes, and sir. being cool. If you got to be done up with weave and wig and makeup and mascara and foundation every single day, that's definitely not a woman. I want an organically natural African queen. Mm. Hair gotta be natural though. That's a not that is a non-negotiable for oh, me. Oh, natural hair. Yeah. Oh, gotta be natural. <laughs> gotta be natural because natural hair is a psycholog, it's a political statement. Mm. When a black woman walks into a space with her own hair, do you know what she's telling everybody in there? Whatever you think about it don't matter. Mm. I like it. Mm. When a black woman rejects European standards of beauty, that speaks volumes about her character. Mm. But more than that, I'm an educator. I'm gonna be building schools for the rest of my life. Yes, sir. And, and when we open up these schools, Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, when we open up these academies across the world, it won't always be boys. We will be opening them up to girls too. Mm. And when those princesses come to school and they see Dr. Umar's wife, mm. What do they say when she got a blonde weave? Mm. What do they say when she got a wig? What mm. do they say when she got green contacts and 10 inches of, of, of makeup on her face? They're gonna be confused. Mm. Mm. Dr. Umar is the founder of the unapologetically African movement and his wife values European standards of beauty. It's a contradiction, my brother. My wife got to be nappy. She has to make the same statement as I make when it comes to our physical presence. I cannot marry a woman who cannot show her true hair. Mm, okay, good. Let's stay right there. Dr. My people showing you love all across the country. Thank you all for your comments and your people. I have so many questions. But I want to ask you, natural hair. Suppose her natural hair is straight. Then that's fine, as long okay, as it's natural. Okay. You know, when we say happy to be nappy, we're speaking of the fact that many of our ancestors come from the Western side of the African continent where their hair is quite nappy, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But we have various phenotypes in Africa. In fact, every phenotype of the planet is represented on the mother continent because Africa is more diverse within herself. There's more diversity in Africa than there is between Africa and any other people. Mm. We are so diverse. So... In East Africa, you tend to see the more European type features or features we associate with Europeans, you know, the thin lips, the thin nose, cheekbones that are not so prominent, a body that is not so curvy on the woman. Yes, okay, straighter hair. 
We have that phenotype in Africa. And you have sisters in America whose ancestors came from East Africa because what a lot of people do not know, good brother, is when the British and the Americans started suppressing the slave trade from West Africa, many of the slave trading companies snuck around the horn of South Africa and into East Africa. Mm. And they connected with the Arab slave traders in East Africa, and they would get their cargo of Africans from the East Coast rather than the West Coast. So some of the people, some of us, as you look at us in America, you say, wow, my mother got straight hair. And we have a lot of black children who erroneously believe if they have straight wavy hair, yes, sir, you know yes, what I mean? Yes, they sir, believe yes, they're sir. Native Americans. That's right. That's I, I, right. I, I'm a Native, no, that hair is indigenous to Africa. It is one of the phenotypes. There's Africans with straight hair. Yes, you sir. understand? So, you know, yes, it's about natural hair. I say nappy because most often it will be that yes, sir. as a result of our West African ancestors. But as long as it is hers, unbleached, unheated, and untreated. Mm. Yes, sir. I like that. Okay, Dr. Umar, we have a few more questions for you. Dr. Uh, he says, um, Dr. Africa used to wear, uh, say, women who wear makeup. Um, their, their nature is military, makeup represents their camouflage. Thank you, sir, for that. Thank you, everybody, for saying peace. Okay, my next question for you, uh, Dr. Umar, my sister Miriam said, wanted to know, she said about reparations. Do you think that's something that we will see? Is it tangible? And do you think that's something we'll see in our lifetime? That's a very good question. And before I answer that, let me encourage your listening audience, for those who may be interested, in their leisure and when it is most comfortable and convenient for them, please, brothers and sisters, help us with the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, you sir. can make your donations on Cash App, uh, dollar sign FDMG School on the Cash App. I repeat, dollar sign FDMG School on the Cash App on PayPal. It's FDMG Academy. So cash.me slash dollar sign FDMG School on your Cash App and paypal.me slash FDMG Academy on your PayPal. And if you wanna mail a check or money order donation, you can get the address on my website or you can text message me forward. Again, that number is 215-989-9858. Couple of thoughts on reparations. Yes, sir. First thought, as you know, in any negotiation, you get more when you negotiate from a position of power. You get less when you negotiate from a position of thirstiness. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. My concern with the reparations dialogue, the popular social media reparations dialogue, one of the problems is it looks like we're operating from a position of thirstiness. Mm. Why do I say that? I keep hearing people say we need to get paid. 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 That's thirsty. Mm, mm. It's not about when you get paid. It's about what you get paid. You follow me, my brother? Yes, sir. Yes, and if sir. we are overly concerned about just getting some money, okay, we just want the check. Just give me a check. If you just want the check, the government will give you a check, but it won't be what your ancestors deserve or you. So I want us to back off of this immediate reparations conversation. I don't believe in immediate. And let me tell you why. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Number one, we need time to finish working through what the reparations package should be. Mm -hmm. We need time to organize the many divergent forces that are operating in the reparations community. In addition to that, we don't want white folks to think we're so greedy for a check that we forget what reparations is all about in the first place. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is about our ancestors, who most of us have failed to honor anyway, mm. who we dishonor on a regular basis anyway. I'm seeing Negroes who live in white communities talk about we need reparations. <laughs> I'm seeing Negroes with white spouses talking about we need reparations. <laughs> I'm seeing sisters with 10 feet of weave, blind weave, talking about we need reparations yes, no sir. disrespect but if i'm a part of the reparations distribution council if i'm a part of the reparations district if you got a blonde weave you married to a white girl you live in a white community you don't get no damn reparations 
Mm. Reparations are for African people who are interested in African liberation, politically, economically, psychologically, spiritually, culturally, and otherwise. Mm. You got a white wife, you ain't you're not gonna take my ancestors' money and give it to your white wife. You're out of your damn mind. Mm. You're out of your mind. You don't take black people's money and give it to white folks. Mm. So you're not getting no reparation. We need to have standards. Mm. Standards. If you even think to benefit from this, these are the behaviors we expect. I don't hear nobody talking about that. Mm. And, and here's the other thing. Reparations is a war. It's a war. It's an economic warfare. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You and I both know you never go to war without an organized army. That's right. That's right. Why are these reparations people antagonizing the government for money when you haven't even organized the black community and got them behind you yet? Are you following me, my brother? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, you don't fight a larger, more organized army with an undisciplined, disloyal army. Black America is undisciplined and disloyal. Organize us, discipline us, get your troops in line. Then we go fight for reparations. Mm, mm. You got Negroes out here on some solo act talking about I'm the voice of reparations. You don't have consensus from us to speak for us. Mm. You don't have consensus from us to negotiate for us. Here's what I believe. I believe that we could continue to organize for reparations. We could continue to intellectualize the reparations package. But my brother, I think reparations should either be postponed until a more mature generation of African people are able to handle that type of responsibility. Mm, because mm. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you. 21st century Africans, those of us who were born or those of us who live at any time between 2020 and 2023, we have not demonstrated at all any accountability or responsibility towards our collective destiny. I don't see any reason why the 21st century African should be the custodian of reparations payout. Mm. We are the most self-hating generation in American history. Mm. We are the most disorganized generation in American history. We are the most selfish. We are the most white loving. We are the most self-destructive. Name me another generation of black folks from 1619 to 2022. And we were here before that, but I'm dealing with British North American oppression. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Show me another generation of blacks. Give me any 20 year period that you think was as irresponsible, disloyal, self-hating as we are right now. Mm. You, there is no one. This mm. is the worst we have produced. And you know what's so ironically embarrassing about it? We are the most educated. Mm. Mm. We have the most skills. We have the most degrees. And we have the most money. We're the 10th richest people in the world, Black America. Yes, sir. Two trillion dollars and not a single black wall street to show for it so let me get this right we blow two trillion every year but yet we think we should be responsible for the distribution of our ancestors reparations think about that for a minute mm, think mm. about that you don't spend the money you already have responsibly you don't spend the money you already have responsibly but we're supposed to trust you with the restitution package. And let me be clear, reparations is not for us. Mm. It's for the entire community of Africans past, present, and future. Yes, sir, yes, sir. I ain't heard nobody say, what part of this are we gonna put in a trust for generations unborn? Mm. What percentage, if we were to get reparations tomorrow, my brother, what percentage of that reparation should be put in trust to future generations. I ain't heard a word about it. If we were to get reparations in our lifetime, my brother, I would want the whole thing to be put in trust to future generations. Mm. We should not be allowed to touch it because we will waste it, my brother. We, mm. And this is why I don't think money should be on the list. And if money is on the list, cash payout 
it should be at the bottom of the list. If you have to ask for money, do you know what you're telling me? Everything else on your reparations list must be inappropriate requests. Mm. Everything on your list, brother, Joshua, should be wealth generating concessions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You understand me? Yes, sir. Control of natural resources. Control of the ports. Control of certain lands. Control of certain industries. Control of certain resources. What am I asking for money for? If what I need is appropriately laid out, I don't need a penny mm. because everything else on my reparation list will generate the wealth that I need, brother. I don't think the people involved in reparations are thinking deeply and comprehensively enough about it. I think a bunch of Negroes just want some money. I'm going to be honest with you, brother. Mm. A lot of these people out here talking about reparations, they just want some money. They ain't thinking about how this is going to benefit us as a race past, present, and future. Because if they give you money, but they don't change the institutions, they give you money, but they don't tackle the main problems. They give you money, but the police is still killing you. What good is a check? And your life still is not safe from police genocide. We got to think better on this, brother. Yes, sir. Powerful. Exactly. We want so many. I mean, the views. Some, some people watching. Thank you. People showing love all across the country. Okay. So, Dr. Umar, what about unity? Will we ever see? Because my sister Mimi talked about Miriam talked about reparations. Will we ever see a unified front so that we can go before and like the Pan African, Nation of Islam, Black Panthers? This like, can we ever come together? Do you think that we will see that, or is that the Million Man March? The closest we'll get to that, will we get something in my lifetime? Will I get to be able to see all of the black leadership in one room and say, man, look, we all together. Let's let's get behind something. Let's do, or is that for future generations? Now, remember, black leadership have come into the same room before, mm, mm, mm. but they rarely exited the room together. Mm, mm, mm. Getting them together will not be your problem. Mm. Keeping them together yes, will sir. be your problem. Yes, sir. One of my many initiatives, Brother Joshua, once the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy is complete, and just for the benefit of your listening audience who may be donors or will soon be donors. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We, right now as we speak, we are about 80, 70% done with the renovation of the Marcus Garvey Elementary School. <laughs> Um, we are 90% done with the renovation of the Nat Turner John Jack Desaline Gymnasium. Mm, okay, yes, sir. I'm saying that to say, and I believe in divine timing. So anytime I give you, put no faith in it because our faith is in the most high and the most high knows best and divine timing will be the ultimate timing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. With that being said, there's a chance that we will have our grand opening for the community in Black History Month 2023. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm hoping to be cross the finish line. Yes, sir. I'm hoping by the end of the calendar, we got the rest of this month and we got December. And I'm hoping that we can cross the finish line in time for that grand opening, brothers and sisters. So please donate. If you want to work at the school, send me your resume. Resumes can be sent to FDMG Resumes, R-E-S-U-M-E-S, -E -S, FDMG Resumes at gmail.com. Although the school will be in all boys schools for the first three to five years before we open up our Anna Douglas, Amy Garvey Princess Academy, our staff and faculty will be co-ed from the very beginning. So for sisters who ask the question, will you have women teachers at your all boys school? Yes, we will. So mm -hmm. sisters, you are encouraged to apply. Send me your resume, fdmgresumes at gmail.com. I will start reviewing resumes on New Year's Day. I'm going to start reviewing resumes. With your resume should be two other documents. One is a photo of yourself and another is a letter of interest. Why do you want to work at this school and why should we consider hiring you? Do not send a resume alone. 
If it doesn't have a cover letter in the photo, we're not even going to consider it. We must follow directions. Sisters, if your hair is not natural, that's okay at this time. Because you know that if you get hired, you will show up with natural hair or I will cut you bald my damn self, right? So we want to be clear about that. But again, go ahead. You're urged to send in your resume, your cover letter, and your photo, a recent photo, fdmgresumes at gmail.com. Don't worry about being a certified teacher. Okay, don't, don't, don't let that be your main. A lot of people said, I'm not a certified teacher. Don't worry about that. The bigger question you should be asking yourself is, do you have a skill that black children need to learn? Mm. Yes, we need math teachers. We need science teachers. We need language teachers. We need social studies. But guess what else we need? We need diet and nutrition teachers. Mm. We need sisters who could do natural hair. We need brothers who could teach African martial arts, gun training, oh. agriculture. Can you teach our children how to sew their own clothing? So we are trying to produce well-rounded African boys and girls. So don't ask yourself whether or not you're a teacher. Ask yourself, do you have a skill that is worth being taught to our babies? Excellent. Okay, Dr. Moore, we just have three more questions for you because so many people are uh, constantly No problem, we good. Yes, sir. So I went to, uh, I see my aunt Aisha in the comments saying teach, and she was a teacher at Muhammad University of Islam in Chicago. And when I went there in middle school, it was all boys. And mm. there was something very significant and important. I didn't understand it because, you know, I want to be around the girls because they was fine and choosing them middle school, that type of thing. But I see the benefit of me bonding with brothers, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, many of people I'm still cool with to this day. It was just us. It was manhood. It was something about our junior FOI camps and things of that nature. What is the benefit from you having a school from all boys? Why is that important for it to be j just boys? In African culture, you spend time with your mother and you spend time with the women mm. until you get to the age of puberty. Mm. Then the men of the village take you away from the women mm. Mm. so you can focus on learning how to be a man. Mm. It is the same thing with the sisters. You are taken from the men by the women so you can be taught how to be a woman. Mm -hmm. So yes, the benefit of a same-sex school is that it allows the children to remain focused on those aspects of gender education that cannot take place in front of the opposite sex. See, in our culture, we very much believe in the balance of masculine and feminine energy. The community can only be in harmony with the appropriate balance of masculine and feminine energy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We don't believe, as America does, that it's perfectly healthy for children to be gender fluid. Mm -hmm. African people don't believe in no gender fluidity. You yes, are sir. born at birth assigned a gender. It's right there between your legs. It is clear. Okay, it, God has left no confusion. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. On whether you will carry the seed or whether you will plant the seed. So we don't believe in uh, gender neutrality and gender fluidity. We don't believe in boys becoming girls and girls becoming boys. That's not our culture. Yes, sir. We trust God and we trust the decision God made when yes, he sir. assigned us a gender and we trust that the decision God made in choosing our gender is best for us. And it is a permanent decision that will take us into death. Mm. See, in African culture, you have a destiny. And your destiny is assigned to your gender. Mm. So when you start messing with your gender, mm. you're messing with the very purpose for why you were put on this earth. Imagine a man who becomes a woman, but you had a masculine destiny. Mm. A woman who becomes a man, you had a feminine destiny. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of black people who are being caught up in this European sexual confusion trap, when they become elders, and it's time for them to get ready to go back home because in Europe culture, we say that earth is the marketplace, heaven is home. Mm. Heaven is home. Okay. okay, When it's time to get ready to go home, a lot of our people are gonna have remorse, brother. 
because you're not going to be able to face your ancestors as you go on up to God for judgment. And your ancestors look at you and say, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. Wait, what? Whoa, what, wait a minute. God told us to assign you mm. a masculine identity in this life. Mm. Who gave you the right to undo what God did? Mm. And I just think a lot of these political problems that we're having as a people in this country are going to become spiritual curses when it's time for many of us to go back home to our Lord. Mm, you teach it. Yes, sir, Dr. Umar. Okay, family, thank you all for so much for the questions. And please put it on YouTube. Dr. Umar, I just wanted to say this. The, in January, maybe closer we get to the school opening, I want to come uh, to the grand opening, you know, God willing, yes, you do it. But can, if you get a chance, you know, free, we can, taxes, you know, everybody's getting paid their taxes, you know, after New Year's and things like that. If you come back on, I, I will make sure that we get some people to help. That's, we can do like a fundraiser, something we can do to help you in that fourth quarter to yes, help sir. raise this money because this is very important. I stand by it. Um, we stand by the People's Podcast and all of the believers and the supporters all across the country. Thank you for your great work. Dr. Like, on a lighter note, what what is your favorite album of all time? Oh, uh, wow. Um, favorite album? Yes, sir. That's going to be... I'll give you one. Okay. And I'm going to go to R&B. All right, let's or go. Or maybe Neo Soul, if you would, I guess. Okay. John Legend's first... Let me tell you what the albums that are significant to. Okay, okay. Tupacalypse Now is very significant to me. Okay. Because that was the album that cemented... That began my relationship with Tupac's music. Okay, okay. Which ultimately cemented him as my favorite hip hop artist of all time. Okay. If I had to give you a Tupac album, it would probably be either, I think Me Against the World. Okay, okay. Or All Lies on Me would be my favorite. Oh, I know my favorite album. Well, albums is tough. I'm gonna give you songs. Albums okay. are tough. Okay. But Tupac is my favorite artist, hands down. Okay, yes, sir. Hip-hop. Whitney Houston is my favorite female singer of all time, hands down. Okay. She's, on, she's on the wall for sure. New yes, Edition, my favorite male group of all time. Okay, you can't go wrong with New Edition. <laughs> uh, lady Group is probably going to be in Vogue. Can't go wrong with In Vogue for sure. And <laughs> my most spiritually... How do I say this? The most spiritually relevant album for me is John Legend's first album. Mm, now, mm. John Legend be doing a lot of cooning. I want to be clear. <laughs> okay, but his very first album, For I sure. think it's called Get Lifted. I think it's yes, Get sir. Lifted. That album was out when I took my maiden journey to Africa. Mm. 30 Days wow. and 30 Nights as Minister of Education for the Marcus Garvey Movement, the UNIA ACL. And I'm listening to John Legend's album. When I get to South Africa, my luggage got shipped to a European country to be inspected. I was without my luggage for the entire South African trip. Mm. And I lost my Walkman, 2005. Mm. And so I went into a store near Alexandria, which is the black community just outside of Johannesburg. Mm. And I and my money was kind of short. I bought me a DV, a CD player in South Africa and some headphones. Mm. And I bought the John Legend album. And I listened to that album, my brother. Yes, sir. Yes, my sir. entire 30-day trip in Africa. Mm, mm. And so when it comes to my connection to the continent, there's no album that puts me in the spiritual vibe of Africa like the first John Legend album. So when you come to FDMG, you will regularly hear songs from the first John Legend album playing because that was the soundtrack of Dr. Umar's first trip to Africa, which changed my life. Mm. Come on and go with me. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> all right, people showing you love all across the country saying dope album, dope album. That's right, Dr. Umar. Excellent, can't go wrong with John Legend. Thank you everybody who's in the comments. All right, just our last two questions uh, for, from you and for you. Um, for people who came in late, who see that we're fighting 
about it. Kanye West got two albums behind me. I'm a huge fan. And Kyrie Irving, one of my favorite point guards. And But in the community, we're fighting right now, each other on social media about the issues. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm losing people because they know where I stand at it. You know, this, is this something, Can are we going to have to keep fighting each other on social media or can there be a medium ground with this, with the attack of Kyrie and, and Kanye? Is, is this, what, what, what's the solution? Believe it or not, most of the back and forth I see over this is not about whether they were right or wrong. Mm, mm. Everybody knows they spoke the truth. Mm. You know what we're split over? Whether it's best to say nothing and save ourselves than stand up and speak out and sacrifice for the people. That's the argument. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is an argument of whether you are going to be a coward or whether you are going to stand up for the cause. That's where I'm seeing. I'm seeing people say, well, you know what? But he's going to lose all his money. Mm. That's because we don't care about the group anymore. It's all about self. When you listen to people talk about this Kyrie Kanye situation, my brother, they're fighting over why is he sacrificing all his money to tell the truth? Mm. Frederick Douglass wouldn't have thought twice. Mm. Harriet Tubman wouldn't have thought twice. Sojourner Truth mm. wouldn't have thought, thought twice. Fannie Lou Hamer wouldn't have thought twice. Ida B. Wells wouldn't have thought twice. Mary Church Terrell, Anna Julia Cooper, they wouldn't have thought twice about giving their life for the people. But because we're so selfish, Brother Joshua, Negroes are saying, I ain't giving up that amount of money just to tell the truth. You see what this is about? It's about <laughs> selfishness because we, my brother, don't have any racial integrity. Mm. We're the only group in America with no racial loyalty at all. Our racial loyalty was switched out for religious loyalty. Mm. So we're religious, we're, we're, we're loyal to our religions, but we're not loyal to our people, mm. you see. Mm, mm, mm. So a Christian will call a white man his brother before a black man because he practices the same religion. Yes, sir. The Muslims will call an Arab their brother before a black man because he practices the same religion. Mm -hmm. We have to get back to our bloodline connections. I don't care what the religion is. We have an ancestral connection that's deeper. Yes, sir. We have a genetic connection that's deeper. We have a cultural and historical connection that's much deeper, but we don't rally around that. Our individuality is going to be our genocide if we're not careful. Our individuality is going to be our genocide if we're not careful. We better wake up and smell the coffee before it's too late. Absolutely. And thank you all. This is our last question to Dr. Umar. He's done a phenomenal job. Dr. Umar, my father was with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan when they were in Mecca and, and in the Middle East, and they offered him so much money, said millions of dollars to come to Mecca and to come to the Middle East and teach mm. and Black people behind. And my father said the minister never turned his back and he said that he would come back he would rather be poor with his people over here than to be rich in Saudi Arabia and Mecca so I think that it's very important that we have a, a self awareness uh to our people first before any other religion or ideology or theology if that matters um Absolutely. my next my last question for you Dr. Umar is what would you like your legacy to be sir I always say that on my tombstone I would like it to say he did the best he could with what he had mm. you know we have five major problems in black america as i've mentioned earlier miseducation mass incarceration gentrification police genocide and access to wealth no one man can fight all five mm. but i can mm. certainly fight one mm. and what i've chosen is the miseducation mm. and so yes. every day of my life is dedicated to helping parents rescue their children from that psychoacademic Holocaust, that special education and ADHD war. Every day I'm helping parents do that. That's my legacy. That's my contribution to the struggle. The Black Parent Boot Camp that we're going to have on November the 19th, that's a contribution. Of uh, the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, that's a contribution because I believe that you must fight the systems that oppress us, but you have to also create the systems that will lead to our success. Mm, mm. So I'm fighting the school system and the mental health system, but I'm also building an alternative, 
And so often we fight, but we never get around to institution building. You have to do both. Yes, it's sir. not whether we need institutions or so we fight racism. You must do both. You must fight the racism and build the institution. So even when we have the school, I'll still be fighting racism in the schools because we won't have enough schools to cater to all of our children in the beginning. But it is my hope that before I leave this planet, every black child will be attending an independent school owned, operated by their own people. It must be all black everything or it is nothing at all. Mm. It must be all, we have to get out of these uh, gray areas. I think black people exist in too much gray space, my brother. Yes, sir. You know yes, how sir. we love the words, it depends. <laughs> and I'm here to say it no longer depends. You either tell them the truth or you're not. Yes, sir. You're yes, either sir. for the people or you're not. Mm, mm. You either free or you're not. Mm, mm. You either independent or you're not. Get out of the gray, get off the fence, choose a side and stick with it because it is black people versus everybody. Mm, okay, do. Yes, sir. Excellent. And on that positive and high note, I want to thank you, Dr. Umar uh, Johnson, for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the People's Podcast. It means a lot to myself, my family, and the viewing audience. Thank you all for watching. We have your we have your back. You you have our support, sir. Anything that thank we you. can do, we are in line with you, sir, to, to better uh, free the minds of our people. Uh, to help give liberation and salvation to the Black nation and Africans all across the diaspora, but specifically in North America. We, we have your back, sir. This is Joshua Leonard Muhammad signing off for the People's Podcast. Peace, my brother. Peace, my brother. Yes, sir. Thank you all for watching.